Okay, thank you for the introduction. Hi everyone, I'm Julian. I'm a PhD student at the University of Münster in Rafael Witkowski's group in the physics department. Today I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about language design and in particular the language design of Rust. So uh, the whole application topic here is uh, many particle dynamics and just to make sure that we are all on the same page, I'll just give you a brief overview. So particle dynamics basically mean you have a system of discrete entities, they move over time and they can interact. And then your simulation goal is usually to dis, uh, um, calculate their trajectories. Now, particles is a really broad term here. It can be pretty much anything from atoms to asteroids. Um, yeah, really, it's your imagination is the limit here. Because in the end, it's all mathematically basically the same. You have a system of couple of differential equations, sometimes ordinary, sometimes stochastical, and you want to solve that. And you could, of course, use your standard or e solver. But in this case, you usually have so many particles that you have an extremely high number uh, of degrees of freedom. Um, you can think of Avogadro's number six times 10 to the 23. We need, a, we need a lot of particles to be realistic. And that's just not, uh, not good in, in standard solvers. So we need specialized solvers for that. So the good thing is uh, this kind of uh, work has been uh, around pretty much since the dawn of scientific computing. So there's a lot of prior art. Uh, here are just two examples, very popular packages, LAMS and GROMAX. Uh, you can find like a, a, an infinitude of, of molecular dynamics package uh, on the internet. Uh, at this point, I apologize to all computational chemists out there. I use molecular dynamics and particle dynamics interchangeably in this talk. Uh, not super precise, but uh, for my purposes, it is. So if there's so much software out there, why uh, are we still thinking about this? Well, the way these software packages usually work, if you've never used them, you basically get a sort of set of numerical primitives and you plug them together and then you basically get the new simulation out of that for your system, hopefully. Now, the problem is if this toolbox is lacking the specific particle type or specific force field that you need and you're kind of out of luck, uh, you can, of course, go into the source code and try to extend these packages, but you basically dig around through uh, three decades old uh, C, C++ or Fortran code you're particularly unfortunate. Uh, so whatever you, you create there, it will be very brittle. You'll probably violate someone's invariant somewhere and it's, it's, it's not a nice experience. Uh, yeah, so um, that's kind of uh, desirable to be improved. And in the end, uh, there's, there's also uh, another more technical aspect because these software packages are so old, they are also designed for software basically 30 years ago. So they often uh, rely on message passing. And if we look at sort of modern trends in hardware, that might not be the most uh, suitable choice. So when you have like 128 cores on your CPU, uh, you might uh, uh, not want the overhead of message passing, but you might just want your shared memory. So uh, luckily I'm not alone in, in, in this uh, analysis of the field. Uh, there's uh, a lot of other packages that try to sort of improve the situation a bit. Uh, I'm particularly fond of OpenMM. I think it's really well designed. Uh, if you want sort of super general uh, packages, OpenFPM and FTPS are, are quite nice. And if you want sort of more of a classical MD experience with a fresh code of Python on it, that's HMD Blue for you. Um, so yeah, lots of options. But I still think we haven't found sort of the, the optimum here. So uh, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we sort of maximize three design goals? We want maximum generality. So any particle system you can imagine should be able, uh, you should be able to simulate. You should abstract away all the sort of nitty technical details because otherwise you might just as well use the general purpose programming language. Ideally, you would also have sort of an escape hatch. So you can uh, sort of, if you really know what you're doing, uh, do whatever you want. And we want uh, shared memory parallelism and we don't want databases, obviously, because again, that's sort of technical difficulty. Um, and if you look at these design goals for, for, for why you realize that there is a language out there that does this really well, it's compromised and that's us. So this is why I give this talk at the Rust workshop. So let's build a sort of inspired by Rust uh, model for molecular dynamics. So first we need uh, a data and a computational model. So a particle is in the most general sense, just some bundle of physical quantities. Um, in order to make uh, for the optimizations of MD to make sense, you need at least the position because that kind of guides the coupling of equations. Um, a particle system is well, basically just multiple particles and they can interact. And particle dynamics basically just means you have a particle system one state, then you apply some rules and then it comes out in another state. Now the problem with this is this means basically every program would be a particle dynamics. 
but that's not too bad great if you want to do static analysis because you can't do static analysis on, on general programs and in particular you can't guarantee safe parallelism. So we need we need some rules. And this is similar to our Rust, it actually does this. Um, if we consider each particle to sort of correspond to a threat, so we sort of want to maximize uh, um, parallelism in our program by treating every particle, at least in principle, in parallel. Um, and then we can look at the rules of borrowing because those are the rules for sort of threats and references in Rust. Uh, and there it says you can either have an arbitrary amount of read-only reference or exactly one mutable reference. So in the particle world, this would basically mean yeah, your quantity could, can either be mutable, but then it can't be seen by any other particles or threats, sort of conceptually, um, or the other way around. So it can be seen by every threats, but it can't be mutated. Now, obviously, you probably want to mutate every quantity at some point in your simulation. So this would basically mean that particles can't interact, but we can use uh, another uh, property of data races. Data races only occur when you have unsynchronized axes. So if you have a few synchronization barriers uh, in your simulation, you can basically sort of apply these rules only uh, to the area within the, these uh, barriers. And then you basically have a much more practical approach to this. Uh, a pretty simple example that would fulfill these rules is a, a system where the particles don't interact. In physics, we call that an ideal gas. That basically means no particle sees any other particles' quantities. Uh, it's a bit boring. I mean, ideal gas are thermodynamically important, but a bit boring after a while. So let's uh, think about a more interesting example. This here is sort of an Euler integration scheme, sort of the most basic integration schemes you can have. Uh, so we have a, uh, I hope you can see my mouse cursor. We have a particle state on the left here. It has three quantities, position, velocity, and force. In the first step of the simulation or the first stage, um, we calculate interaction forces. This usually depends on the particle's position, maybe also their velocity, which have a particularly weird force. Um, but because we calculate forces, forces will be mutated, so these must be invisible. So this stage here cannot depend on the force that was basically done in the previous time step. Then we have a synchronization barrier, so we basically burn all our, all our references and start again. Um, so now we hand out references. Uh, um, so now we want to um, update velocity and position. Okay. Uh, so now uh, we basically do the reverse with velocity and uh, position to be invisible. So uh, just very quickly on the implementation, we call it the fearlessly integrating particle simulator. It's basically your textbook compiler. So we use the really excellent Rust PEG crate for uh, prototyping a parser. And then in the end, we feed it into LLVM, generate code. And from the user perspective, it's just a Rust library. And uh, we actually use Rust as sort of our escape hatch because we can in LLVM cycle control for between our generated code and the Rust application. So you can also do all your pre and post processing in Rust. Okay, and that's basically everything. You can find a paper here uh, on the deep model, the software here, and if you want to have a chat, there's a Zulip link. Thank you.